You know, in the ancient Roman world, there were very few things more terrifying to contemplate than the prospect of being crucified. It was something that they saw all the time. One article I read said the practice became especially popular in the Roman-occupied Holy Land. Now, it's worded that way because you have to remember crucifixion didn't start with the Romans. It started before that. But they really got into it and perfected it and kept it going. It says in in the year 4 B.C., the Roman general Varus crucified 2,000 Jews. So that's like, I don't know, five a day. And that's just the Jewish people, right? And there were mass crucifixions during the first century A.D., according to the Roman Jewish historian Josephus. You know, it's, it's no surprise, really, that the followers of Jesus seem to have just almost refused to believe him when he told them that that's what was going to happen to him. It had to have been confusing. I mean, it was, it was too horrible to think about. For one thing, they were sure that Jesus had come to conquer the Romans, not, not to be crucified by the Romans. He, they, they came to the conclusion, he's the guy. This is the Messiah. I mean, the Messiah's, Messiah's going to defeat these people, not be crucified by them. What is kind of surprising, if you think about it, is how patient he was, how persistent he was in warning them over and over again that 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 was exactly what was going to happen. And it's, it's hard, I think, for us to really grasp what it meant. The the curse of, the humiliation of being crucified. Not, not, not just executed, but crucified. It was, it was something special in a horrible kind of way. In Matthew chapter 20, verse 17, which is where we pick it up, continuing our study through the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus and his followers were in the area of Jericho. Next week, we'll see that, you know, he's leaving Jericho. But they're in that general area. And, and, and Matthew tells us now, Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the 12 disciples aside on the road. So if you can picture it, he's got a, he's got a big crowd of people. He has, at this point, he has a lot of people following him around. But he pulls the 12 to one side on the road, and he, and he said to them, Behold, we're going up to Jerusalem. And remember, anytime you find that word behold, it's kind of an emphasis. It's like Jesus was saying to them, Guys, you need to pay attention to this. You need to be aware. You need to, you need to contemplate. Think about this with me. We are going up to Jerusalem. And the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests And to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify. And the third day he'll rise again. Mark's gospel, in his account of this, tells us that Jesus was kind of leading the way. In other words, he's got this big crowd of people, but he's out in front of them. And that all who followed along behind him were amazed and afraid. And it just kind of throws that out. Mark just kind of throws that out there. They're they're following him and they're amazed. And they're afraid. We have the the benefit of knowing the end of the story. You know, we know the whole the whole thing, but, but they didn't know. And they're following along behind him, clearly still thinking that he intended to do then what the Bible says he's going to do in the future. 
defeat the Romans, overthrow them, you know, establish his kingdom, set up a government. The Bible says one day Jesus will show up with the armies of heaven in which you and I who love him will be soldiers. I'm amazed sometimes at how much I wasn't taught as a young man going to church, attending Sunday school week after week after week after week after week. You know, I mean, I, I, I have like the vaguest memory of being in the nursery in the Baptist church in Georgia. You understand what I'm saying? I was like, I was a toddler. I remember we feared Mrs. Walker and her paddle. It's like a little three-year-old. If she said jump, you said how high, right? Because otherwise you got to pop. But I wasn't, there's so many things I wasn't taught. You know, we were, we were taught the Bible stories. I mean, I knew about Jonah and the whale. I knew about David and Goliath. And, you know, I mean, I, I knew the Bible stories. But I didn't understand that the Bible teaches that one day Jesus is going to rule the earth. And that that those who've loved him and followed him are, are going to be a part of that for a thousand years. Actually, over a thousand years. We just don't know how much over a thousand years. And that it's after that that Judgment Day will take place. But see, 2,000 years ago, his mission was to submit himself to a cruel, humiliating death in order to defeat death for you and me. So that, the way the Bible words it, so that death would no longer have dominion over us. He submitted himself to that. And even though this was the third time now that Jesus had talked to them about his crucifixion and resurrection, he you know, told them what to expect, they were still in denial about it. Verse 20 says, now think about this, okay? Jesus has just told them, listen, I'm going to be betrayed to the chief priests, to the scribes. They're going to condemn me to death. It's pretty clear, right? Everybody understand what that means? They did too. Peter, James, John, the others, they would have understood this terminology, this what, you know, they, they, they understood his speech. They just couldn't quite wrap their minds around the idea. Messiah is going to be condemned to death. And then they're going to hand me over to the Gentiles who are going to mock me. They're going to, they're going to make fun of me, and they're going to scourge me, and then they're going to crucify me. But on the third day, I'm going to rise again. And then check this out, verse 20. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him with her sons, James and John, by the way, kneeling down and asking something from him. And he said to her, what do you wish? She said to him, grant that these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right hand and the other on your left in your kingdom. Now, in my mind's eye, I can't help but see Jesus kind of shaking his head at this point. Yeah, oy vey, who said that? That was perfect. Oy vey. Jesus answered and said, you do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink and be baptized with a baptism that I'm baptized with? They said to him, we are able. Now, pause right there for just a second and try to digest the pride the arrogance. Because every single one of us are capable. No, let me rephrase that. Every single one of us are guilty of that. He says to them, you don't know what you're asking for. Are you able to drink the cup are you able to be baptized with the baptism? And they both stood up and 
Absolutely, we got this. They had no idea how far short of this they were. Now listen to me really carefully. This is a, this is a rabbit trail, and I'm not going to spend much time on it. God shook me, just grabbed me and shook me years ago. Because I reached a point where, you know, I, I'd been studying the Bible week after week, after, day after day after day, 15, 20 years, whatever. And I had stopped listening. And what I mean by that is one day I found myself not really paying attention to another pastor who was teaching the Bible. Because I've been teaching this book a long time already. And, and, and un, kind of unconsciously, it wasn't, you know, it was a subtle thing. I was thinking to myself, I've been teaching the Word of God longer than you have. Maybe longer than you've been alive. You got nothing for me. And so I'm checking email. Or I'm in the, I'm in the cafe completely ignoring just doing my own thing, hanging out, catching up on something. And, and this was in a conference setting. And God just kind of grabbed my heart in a moment. You know what I mean? Was, you ever had one of those times when you realize conviction kind of comes out of left field? Who do you think you are? It was one of those moments for me. And I realized the pride and the arrogance that had taken over. And the fact that I was comparing myself with another human instrument of Almighty God. See, that's what happened in, in this passage. These two men comparing themselves with others enlisted mom's help, apparently. We want to sit one on the right, one on the left. And Jesus basically said to them, are you sure? You sure that's what you want? Because, see, if you want a position of honor in the kingdom of God, you got to be destroyed. You understand? Crushed. Do you really want to be utterly crushed by your father? Is that what you want? Can you drink the cup that I'm about to drink? Can you be baptized with the baptism that I'm about to be baptized with? Yes! Look at what he says next. Yeah, you will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give. But it is for those for whom it's prepared by my Father. When the ten heard it, they were greatly displeased with the two brothers. But Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. Alistair Begg did a whole sermon on that one statement. 
It shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. Whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, to give his life a ransom for many. You know, what hit me as I read through this, I can't really imagine. I, and I, I, I know already, I know Jesus being, you know, God the Son, God in the flesh, could not, technically could not be discouraged, okay? But this would have been so, I mean, disheartening. Maybe, maybe, maybe that's a good word. He's told them three times. He's talked to them about this stuff. And he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be betrayed. I mean, what a, what a horrible thing just all by itself. I'm going to be betrayed to the chief priests and, and, and to the scribes, and they're going to turn me over to the Gentiles and, and, and you know, can sentence me to death and, and turn me over to the Gentiles. And the, and the Gentile leaders, the, the, the Romans, they're going to make fun of me, and, and, then, and then they're going to, scourge me. They're going to use that whip, that cat of nine tails, and beat me mercilessly, and then they're going to crucify me. And on the third day, I'll rise again. And these guys come and say, yeah, but could we get the, could we get the good seats? I mean, when, we don't really understand all that stuff, but, but when you come into your kingdom, could, could we get the really good spots? That would have been for me, that would have just been so hard. It's like, guys, seriously? That's what you're focused on right now? That's what you're focused on, that, that you get what you want out of it all. And what did they want? They wanted recognition. That's what they wanted. This wasn't all about like power and money and pleasure. No, no, no. It was this was this was about recognition. You remember last week Peter asked the question, I mean, we've given up everything to follow you. So what are we what are we gonna have in in your kingdom? They were all hoping for some recognition. They, they were all hoping for a payoff, in a sense. They were hoping for positions of honor. <clears throat> Nobody was listening closely enough, it would seem, to fully appreciate the significance of what Jesus was saying. There's no record that any of them even asked him a question about that three-day part. I mean, wouldn't it, wouldn't it be great if somebody had just asked the question, wait a minute, wait a minute, why are you going to wait three days? I mean, why are you going to go through all that? Why, why, do, why do you have to go, like, the whole thing and be buried and, and I mean, what are you going to be doing for three days anyway? And how's that going to work? I mean, you say you're going to rise again, but I mean, is it, is it going to be like a big show? I mean, should we all get popcorn and hang out and wait? Is it going to be fireworks? Is it going to be this big display? Is, it, is everybody going to see it happen? I mean, how, how is this going to work? All I'm saying, if they'd really been paying attention, somebody would have asked some questions. And I think it would be great to know exactly how that went. I mean... The stone got rolled in front of the tomb, and when the women got there three days later, the stone had been removed. And Jesus was gone. And to have some just, I don't know, a little detail, it'd be cool. All they could think about was how they fit in. What's in it for me? I mean, what? It reminds me of something in the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah the prophet, you know, he's known as the weeping prophet because 
it's like God never gave him anything good to say. It's, it, he, he would have been the most unpopular preacher ever. Nobody would have showed up for Jeremiah. And he had this guy named Baruch that apparently was the one who actually wrote things down for him. And in chapter 45, God actually prophesies through Jeremiah directly to Baruch. Listen to this. The word that Jeremiah the prophet spoke to Baruch, the son of Neriah, when he had written these words in a book at the instruction of Jeremiah. In the fourth year of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, saying, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, to you, O Baruch. Can you imagine? You're writing this down for the prophet. And all of a sudden, it's like, wait, what? This is to me? This is not just, this is to me, personally. And this is what he said to him. Verse 3, you said, woe is me now, for the Lord has added grief to my sorrow. I fainted in my sighing, and I find no rest. Thus you shall say to him, thus says the Lord, behold, what I have built, I will break down. And what I have planted, I will pluck up. That is, this whole land. And do you seek great things for yourself? Do not seek them. For behold, I will bring adversity on all flesh, says the Lord. But I will give your life to you as a prize in all places wherever you go. Now, see, apparently this guy, he's listening to all this stuff. And, and it, 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 you know, Jeremiah's you know, prophesying doom and gloom for Israel. And, and Baruch's getting... Upset. He's got some ambitions. I mean, he's got, you know, he has some things he wants for himself. And God confronts it. He's discouraged. And God says, oh, it's going to be worse than you think. And you need to Stop seeking great things for yourself. And just be grateful that I'm going to keep you alive. See, that's kind of the context. I'm going to keep you alive. But I'm going to send adversity on all flesh. Nobody escapes it. Wow. You know... I tend to think that was not what Baruch was hoping to hear from God. Right? Most of you, you probably came to church today hoping for a a spiritual pep talk, you know, a boost before you go into your week. I I don't know how many times I hear that. You know, I'm just grateful to, you know, come to church on Sunday to get a good charge before I go into my week. Well, hey, sorry. (laughs) Just like the... The 12, as they were going with Jesus, you know, they just could not get it through their heads. He's not here to make all my dreams come true. That's what they were hoping for. He's going to stand on the Mount of Olives, call down fire from heaven, consume Pontius Pilate and King Herod and all the Roman soldiers and and, and, and he's going to appoint me as his prime minister and you as the chief of staff. And this is the Supreme Court back here. And, man, we're going to. And he's like, not today. No, fellas, not this week. Later, I mean, later. But not right now. You know what struck me with this, too, is Jesus was deliberately walking them all straight into a trap. That's striking, right? Because these were, the, these were the apostles. This is not just anybody. These were the apostles. He's walking them straight into a trap. Wow. Wow. 
And he's telling them about it. I mean, he's, he's trying to warn them the whole time, but they're not listening. And what I see happening in our world today is that, well, it's just like he, just like he said that there would be an awful lot of deceptive prophets prophesying peace and promising all kinds of things and not telling people the truth. Jesus, Jesus told them the truth. He didn't tell them what they wanted to hear. He told them, no, we're going to, we're going to Jerusalem. And it's, it's going to be horrible. They're going to they're gonna crucify me. Do you understand the, the Bible says that in the last days, the love of many will grow cold. And they're going to be lovers of pleasure instead of lovers of God. And if you want pep talks and feel-good sermons, they abound. But if you just study the Bible, it ain't all going to be like that. Jesus made sure that he instructed those who followed him. And, and, and that he, he, he told them what was going to happen. Every step, you know, it's like they're going to, yes, I'm going to be betrayed. They're going to kill me. They're going to do, I'm going to rise again. And see, here's the thing that you, that's just too important to miss. The mission continues. The mission continues. The ministry and mission of Jesus the great servant king, it, it didn't end at the cross. It didn't even end at the empty tomb. It continues. Now, I know he hung on the cross, and, and, and John 19.30 records the fact that he said, it is finished. And then bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. But see, when he said, it is finished, he wasn't talking about his mission. He was talking about phase one. The redemption part. The, the sin of humanity has been paid for. It was, it was paid for on the cross. When he gave his life as a ransom, we were bought back. Death was defeated. It's finished. But do you understand he continued the mission after the resurrection? Acts chapter 1. Luke wrote this. He said, The former account that I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after he through the Holy Spirit had given commandments to the apostles whom he'd chosen and to whom he'd also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days, speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you've heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? See, they're still confused about it. After the resurrection, are you going to do it now? And he said to them, it's not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. 
and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. You see, the mission continues. Now, when he spoke in these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven." What was he saying? The mission continues. Even the angels after the ascension, they're standing there amazed at what they're seeing. Jesus physically ascending into heaven, and they're all standing there. But see, part of the reason they're standing there staring is they're like, what now? And the answer to that question is the mission continues. And the angels basically said, what are you doing just standing there looking up into heaven? He's coming back. But between now and then, the mission continues. The mission continues. The Bible says you and I are supposed to be out there in the power of the Holy Spirit as his witnesses. In other words, we're supposed to be testifying to the world around us about Jesus. And as we prepare to enter this Christmas season, we need to remember that Christmas, it's definitely about the promise that was kept, right? God put skin on, and he, and, and he, he, he came just like he promised. But it's also about the promise anticipated. He's coming back. And that needs to be the focus. Do you have any sense of purpose, mission, urgency? Because it could happen any day now. And as we celebrate his coming, we need to be anticipating his return. That has to be something. Listen to me, because you're going to hear me talk about this between now and Christmas. This has to be a focus. As we celebrate and give thanks for the baby in the manger, it must be a reminder. The way maker, see, that's about more than just you getting your stuff dealt with. The promise keeper, you see, he didn't just promise James and John that they were going to drink the cup and be baptized with the baptism. He promised that to all of us. All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution, he said. It's not not a maybe, not some. He said all. And you know what? Please hear my heart with this. See, the promises that many times you and I are afraid to claim for ourselves, like that one, Those are the actual blessings. Those are the actual blessings. There are an awful lot of people who, they're getting recognition right now. They're viewed as teachers and preachers, as spiritual leaders, or business leaders. You know, they're wealthy. They've got all the fun toys. The book of Proverbs says, don't envy those people because it doesn't last long. It's all going up like a puff of smoke. And if that's all they have on the other side of the curtain, pity them. We need to be living with a sense of anticipation. Any day now, 
Any day now, this is all going to be over for us. Any day now, he's coming back. He's going to keep the second part of his promise. Because, yes, he came, and he, and he suffered, and he died, and he defeated death, and he redeemed us all. He is still coming back to establish an earthly kingdom. He hasn't finished. The mission continues. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 15, 51. He said, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised, incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Any day now. I want to invite the band to come on back up. Erica, you guys, if you would. And as they do that, I, I have to ask you, have you actually asked God to be the God of your life? Because, see, I, I remember growing up in church, you know, like I said, I, I can remember being a toddler. And, you know, and I mean, I, I grew up, I heard the message week after week after week after week after week. And, but but I, I came to the conclusion that all I needed to do was say a prayer asking Jesus to be my Savior, forgive my sins. If I just said the words... Well, that's what it meant to accept Jesus, and, and then I could be baptized, and, and then it really didn't matter what I did after that. And I had this total misunderstanding of the grace of God. And, and see, what I find is, you know, there's, there's so much confusion today. You know, I, I, the people want to argue about can you lose your salvation, can you not lose your salvation, The conclusion that I reached after years of agonizing over it is, no, you can't lose it. The problem is most people who call themselves Christians don't even have it. They're playing a game, and they, they don't even realize they've been deceived. But Paul said to the Galatians, God is not mocked. You can't play games with God. And the only way for a person to be saved is for the all-knowing, all-powerful God to put his spirit inside them. That's what makes a person a Christian. Praying a prayer, saying the right words, going, jumping through religious hoops, that, that, that doesn't make you a Christian. When God the Father looks at your heart and says, that one's mine, sends his spirit to live inside you and your body becomes his temple, he does not change his mind about that and move back out six weeks, six years later. No, he either moves in and gives you life or he says no. And if he moves in and gives you life, everything changes. Everybody around you knows something happened. What happened to her? She's different. He's different. So again, I ask you the question, have you, have you truly, have you sincerely asked him to be the God of your life? Because if you haven't, you need to do that, like right now. You need to recognize you can't do better than having God in charge of your life, teaching you, leading you, guiding you and instructing you. You can't do better than that. And Jesus has paid for everything if you just ask. Just ask. He'll be your God.
Would you bow your heads? Father, I pray for these men and women who are gathered here this afternoon. You're the only one who can identify who's yours and who's not. The ones who are not yet yours, the ones who have not yet given themselves to you in humility. I pray that you draw them into the family right now, that they would be able to, that they would be able to see how much you love them, that they would be able to understand what it means to be yours. That they would sense, that they would sense your presence, that they would feel your touch, God. So that they would be able to to choose, make a, make a wise, informed choice. Please keep your heads bowed, keep your eyes closed. And it, if you realize today, maybe you've called yourself a Christian for years and years and years, like I did, but you realize that you've not, you've not really known him like that. You've, but you're ready right now. You're, you're crying out to him silently, asking for his help, asking for his forgiveness, asking God to be the God of your life. If that's you, would you raise your hand so that I can just agree with your prayer and pray with you and for you right now? Just lift your hand up if right now you're crying out to God for the first time to be the God, really be the God of your life. Good. Anybody else? Father, I thank you for these who today are calling out to you. They, they've, they've heard how difficult, how hard it, it can be. But they're saying to you, please be my God. Please forgive my sins. Please, please lead me and give me your instructions. Give me directions. Just be the God of my decisions. Be the God of my thoughts. The God of my desires. The God of my hopes and ambitions and dreams and everything. And Father, I, I agree with their prayer and I ask you to please fill them with your Holy Spirit empower them now to to go and live it out and and to to be your witnesses in their world to talk about you with other people and to be faithful to you we can't we can't do it without your enabling grace, without your strength, without your power working in us. But you've given us that. You've given yourself to us to, to enable those hard choices and those difficult decisions that we have to make. Keep us, God, living in that anticipation of what you're going to do, the, the, the next phase that we're all going to be a part of. Help us to not be distracted and caught up in the craziness, but to, to really live our lives anticipating your return. Please hold the elements so that
that we can share together.